uh, at Pine Grove State Fern Pine Grove Furnace State Park uh, near us, right outside of Carlisle. Uh, there is Laurel Lake. And there's lots of Mount Laurel there in South Mountain. There's Laurel Mountain Ski Resort. There's Laurel Ridge State Park. All kinds of references to Mount Laurel. There's even a state Laurel Festival in Wellsboro, Pennsylvania, which is in uh, Tioga County. Uh, it happens every June towards the end of the, the week or end of the month. Uh, I'm told there is a state Laurel Queen that is crowned. There's parades, crafts, all kinds of stuff. So definitely check that out. Plus, there's tons of Mount Laurel merch out there. I don't know if any of you have ever searched for it. There was the state symbol stamps a long time ago. Uh, there is a company, Mountain Laurel Designs, that makes tarps, tents, and backpacks for, camp for ultralight camping. There's wine, there's beer, there's candles, and of course the spoons that we talked about earlier. And any kind of uh, item that you would like, you can get Mountain Laurel on. It's also been inspiration for a lot of artists. So if you search around, there's a lot of really beautiful fine art, watercolors, botanical drawings, uh, photography. Uh, it is a really striking plant. And especially if you've never seen one of those thickets at the end of May or early June, it, it, it really is beautiful. I even found a lot of poems. Here's one by Louisa May Alcott, which I'm not gonna read this, um, but maybe you can come back and, and read it later. Um, another one I found um, that was specific to Pennsylvania, I thought maybe spoke a little bit more to me. Uh, it talks a lot about the types of habitats that Mount Laurel prefers in our state. Uh, and then it ends so strongly, long mayest thou haunt these Appalachian slopes, be our sovereign state's resplendent flower. Ah, stirs the heart. Um, but I, I put these on here just to sort of to end the talk and also to just show that it is a, a flower that is so ubiquitous in Penn's woods. Uh, it, it almost seems that it was meant to be. You know, when you talk about um, who found it, where it was sent first, uh, where it grows and its proximity to Philadelphia and people finding it very early in the settlement of the New World, uh, the fact that Joseph Rothrock, the, the father of Pennsylvania forestry, studied it. The fact that Gifford Pinchot, uh, uniquely among our governors, was the first uh, leader of the US Forest Service and a conservationist, to have him be the one to make the final choice uh, about it. Um, it. It really, I think, and when I think about Pennsylvania, when I think about the woods that I enjoy recreating in, that I work in, um, it would be hard to imagine most of those places without Mount Laurel as part of the backdrop. Uh, and I think it's a really great choice. And I, for one, am really proud that our state chose this flower. I have lots of references. Like I said, I, I did a lot of research because I didn't know all this. Um, but I hope you all found it enjoyable. Uh, and you can check out these websites, a few uh, scientific papers that I mentioned or that were useful as well. Uh, and I'll make sure that the Wildwood folks post this in some way so it can be shared. Um, and with that, I really appreciate you all taking the time to listen uh, and hopefully learn a little bit about Mount Laurel. And I'm happy to take any questions and attempt to answer them if you'd like. Hey, thank you very much, Kelly. That was wonderful. Um, so there were some questions that came through. I tried to write them all down so I wouldn't miss any. All right, lay them on me. All right, first we have one from Jen, Ella, and Molly. Um, we talked about how Mount, Laurel's, Mount Laurel is poisonous to animals, and they asked if it's also poisonous to us if we eat it. Yes, it is. And um, you, know, you can look it up online. There's a lot of information about um, Native Americans and some colonists using it for certain ailments, but again, it comes down to anything. It's the dosage, right? Um, but it is considered toxic. Uh, and actually, if you do some further research, there's a thing called um, mad honey, which is from Nepal, but the same toxin is in rhododendron species they have, and they actually sell that honey as medicine or hallucinogen. Um, 
So I don't know that I would recommend trying it at all and consider it toxic. It's not toxic to touch, like poison ivy would be. It's fine to be around it. I'm usually covered in the pollen if I'm trudging through it in the summertime, uh, but you don't want to eat any of it or uh, eat any honey that's been collected by honeybees um, from Mount Laurel. Okay, makes sense, thank you. All right, we have another question from Molly. Um, will the flowers make new pollen after it flings it out? Uh, no, so they're only gonna make pollen once. And with a lot of species that have some sort of unique mechanism for distributing the pollen, it's sort of a one and done sort of situation. But with each plant, you know, if it's an average size four to six foot plant, it may have a few hundred to a thousand flowers. It's still producing a lot of pollen. Uh, and it's really counting on only one or two or a handful of bees making it, right? It's going to throw as much pollen, uh, you know, hit those filaments with as many bees as they can and hope for the best. That's all any plant can do. So it will only produce once. That flower will die. Uh, if it was pollinated, then it will produce that fruit. If it wasn't, there won't be any fruit there. It'll just be sort of the dead flower stem. Uh, but the next year, it'll push up new flowers and new pollen. Nice, thank you. Okay, we have one from Ella Gold. Do the flowers close up at night or do they remain open? That's a great question. And I did not find any information about that. My speculation would be that they remain open. A lot of flowers that are potentially pollinated by moths are the ones that have the variegation in them. So if you look at a lot of orchids, a lot of other wildflowers, a lot of species have a, a white, a yellow, a pink, a blue uh, variegation in the petal. And a lot of that stuff is on a different light spectrum. And you know, moths and butterflies see in a lot of other lights that we cannot see. And those variegations tend to actually be an attribute that's probably more like a giant neon sign or bulletin board for the right insect to fly in there, almost like a landing strip. So given that it has the variegations, my guess is they stay open at night, but I, I don't know for sure. And that's a great question. Oh, that's interesting. That makes sense. I mean, I, now that I think about it, probably too, the, the fact that it relies on those filaments being stretched really taut, it probably wouldn't be beneficial for that plant to open and close very many times, right? Because if you think about a spring, the more times that it flexes, the less strong it is. So my guess is that when it's open, it's open. And then once it's touched, those filaments spring, and that's pretty much it. I don't think the open and close would really benefit those filaments. Hmm. Those are my two speculations. There's, that was hey, a great they, question. they sound good. It makes a lot of sense. <laughs> All right. So Karen asked, why would it be more prevalent for upslope and higher elevation? Is that temperature related? Um, and then would that mean that it wouldn't grow as well down here in the valley? Well, uh, generally speaking, a lot of our ridgetops tend to be more acidic because all the limestone, which is more calcium or calcareous, uh, eroded down into the valleys. So that's why the valleys have such uh, better soil for agriculture. And a lot of our ridges, especially right around Harrisburg, tend to be really rocky. And that sandstone or shale that was underneath the limestone is a lot harder to erode. So it comes to the top and just sort of sits there, almost like the spine of the mountain. And that is, tends to be very acidic. So you have a lot more uh, acidic uh, bedrock and acidic soils uh, on those ridge tops and mid slopes, and the, the better soils are closer to the ground level. And that's why, as you work your way down a ridge top, down a slope, the Mount Moral sometimes tends to peter out. Now, you do have places that have acidic soils from the top to the bottom of the ridge, places like South Mountain. If you go there, it's growing sort of at the base of the mountain and at the top, because the soils are just a little bit more acidic in most places there. Um, but generally, the better soils in Pennsylvania are at the base where everything is eroded down to. So those, those tend to be more basic and not really as good for mountain wall. Okay, so it goes more by the soil type than by the temperature. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, given that it's a woody plant, it's evergreen, Temperature is not really going to be a big factor for that plant. Moisture maybe more so because you could get that leaf spot if it's too humid for too long or remains kind of damp and moist underneath. Um, 
one exception that I'm thinking to the acidic uh, ridge tops versus basic valleys would be places where you have uh, hemlock forests. They're at the base of the mountains and they tend to be acidic because of the tannins in the hemlock needles. So those are other places where you find a lot of rhododendron and mountain laurel because the, the hemlocks have made it so, so to speak. Okay. okay. And we have another one from Karen. Um, have there been any, let me bring this one up. I took a, I have a picture of this one instead of writing it. Have there been any trials done to explore and compare the various cultivars in terms of their nectar production, attractiveness to pollinators, et cetera? Uh, the paper that I found had a lot, it was a horticultural paper, so it had a lot more to do with plants longevity and growing success in terms of being a profitable plant to sell people that would be able to grow and not die right away. Uh, I suspect that you could find some papers that would at least talk about um, maybe the amount of nectar, maybe just what species visit them. Um, some native plants have more of that research done than others, uh, but I didn't come across anything that was that specific. Uh, I think generally, given that there's not much nectar in the flowers, um, probably it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Uh, there may be, and probably too, I can't speak for that gentleman who made those variations initially, but he was probably thinking more about colors of flowers, numbers of blooms, size of the plant, ability to tolerate different soils, probably not so much about nectar. So it also wouldn't surprise me if the cultivars don't really have any nectar, because that could have just been a trait that wasn't selected for, and some of the other traits uh, kind of took over. Or maybe a dark pink one that he chose just happened to be one that didn't have a lot of nectar, and then that's sort of the mother or father plant that's gone down through the, the line of plants, if that makes sense. Okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then we also had, we just had a comment from Eric um, he said that he recently rescued a bunch of young mountain laurel from a neighbor's septic mound because the young ones were starting to kind of take over a little bit and seed themselves. Um, and he, you had, when you were talking about the deer browse, he mentioned that he has had some troubles with deer browsing his young plants. Okay. Yeah, that sounds about right. And I mean, deer are very uh, fickle and finicky about what they eat when they eat it. So. Um, Two, it probably has a lot to do with what else is growing there. If there's not much else to eat there, then they may favor the mountain laurel more than they would in a typical forest setting where there's more choices. Um, okay, that's great. And we have all of the comments now that are coming in are just saying how great of a job you did and who knew you could talk about mountain laurel for an hour. I didn't but either, to be quite <laughs> honest. I was hoping you could, uh, and I hope it was entertaining, and I thank you all, because I appreciated the opportunity to talk about it. I advocate very strongly, as you can imagine, for all of our native plants, uh, but especially now for mountain laurel, now that I know so much more about its history. Uh, and uh, Kayla, we'll have to make sure we find some way to, to share the slides, too, if we can. Uh, PDFs, yeah, something maybe, because that way folks can check out those references if they would like to. Yes, yeah, if we can do that, I can send it to everyone who attended, and um, I also had asked you about recording it, so I've been recording it. It did kick me out for some reason for a little bit, um, but I got back in, so I might have missed a couple slides, so if we had those PDFs, that would be, that would be great. So Okay, awesome. That. Yeah. Sounds um, good. Yeah, so thank you again, and I just want to remind everyone, like Heather said at the beginning, that we will be having the next lecture in two weeks on the 26th. That lecture though will not be on Office Suite HD meeting. We'll actually be doing that one through Microsoft Teams. Um, so I just wanted to give you a heads up about that, but sign up is still the same. If you haven't registered, feel free. And thank you all for joining. Thank you, Kelly. No problem, happy to do it. And uh, thank you all very much. Thank you, have a good night, everybody. Hopefully we'll see you next in two weeks for the next one. Thank, Thank you. you. You're welcome. Thank you for watching. You guys had wonderful questions. You girls are very smart. Thank, Thank you. you. Maybe we were the furthest visit uh, watchers. Where are you coming from? From Willow Grove. 
Oh, I I did see that. Where is that at? I'm not sure. Um, it's near. Um, it's north of Philly, about oh. ten miles north. Oh, wonderful! Um, but I but um we I grew up in Harrisburg and they um my girls have visited Wildwood a lot. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you for joining. That's one of the advantages of having virtual programs. So it doesn't matter who you are. And just so you but, know, there are grandchildren. Hi, guys. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> That's wonderful. Thank you all so much. Good night. Have a Bye. good night. Bye. Bye.